According to a report released by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, Australians spent about $5.8 billion on methamphetamine and $470 million on heroin in 2019. About $1.2 billion was paid to international wholesalers overseas for the smuggled drugs, and about $5 billion remained in Australia's economy. That's a lot of money being made in this country. So what's wrong with our approach to stopping this epidemic? Dr. John Coyne is head of Northern Australia Strategic Policy Centre and head of Strategic Policing and Law Enforcement at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. His latest report, co-authored by Tegan Westendorf, is called High Rollers, a study of criminal profits along Australia's heroin and methamphetamine supply chains. John Coyne, thanks for joining us once again. Always a pleasure, Mike. Why was heroin and meth the focus of the study? Um, look, I wanted to give a couple of things. So first and foremost, I wanted to give people a sense of an idea of the scale and um, breadth of the heroin and, um, and methamphetamine trade in our region. Uh, I wanted to show people that, uh, that you know, the heroin that is consumed and the cocaine that is consumed in the streets of Sydney uh, or Melbourne, where it originates and all the things that go into making that um, possible. Secondly, I wanted to provide a tangible piece of evidence base for law enforcement in this country to better target and have a better impact on um, transnational serious organised crime. And third, um, to be very frank, you know, on one side, and let's be honest, alcohol and um, tobacco products cause more harm in our society. But, you know, next down that rung of, of, of great harms, as we see in our community, um, for those around in the 90s, they saw the heroin epidemic. And then, of course, over the last decade and a half, we've seen um, our communities scourged by um, methamphetamine. So they were just natural selections of drugs to cover in the report. Mm. The report says Australians spent around about $5.8 billion on methamphetamine, um, $470 million on heroin in 2019. About $1.2 billion was paid to international wholesalers overseas for the amphetamine and heroin that was smuggled into Australia that year. Now, about $5 billion remained in Australia's economy. To get to those figures would have required probably significant data. If we have this precise data, they would have to have a really good indication of the makeup of a supply chain from start to finish. Surely, if they had this information, they would know the players involved and could stop much of this. But in um, your report, though, in your report, heroin and meth are on the up by about 17%. So why can't they stop it if they have this data available? Okay, there's two parts to ways to answer this. The first one is that there's an assumption that decapitation works. Okay, so there's an assumption that everybody who is watching this will have watched a, um, a pop culture movie, a television series, where they've got the Mr. Big has been caught by law enforcement and the whole organisation falls apart and everyone lives happily ever after. Unfortunately, that is far from the case. And in fact, if we track back historically, uh, in modern history anyway, we don't see any clear evidence that taking out the Mr. Big uh, has a clear impact on supply. Okay, let's go to Colombia. Um, Pablo Escobar gets shot, killed. Uh, cocaine supply gets fragmented across um, South and Central America. No real impact. And in fact, you'd argue the situation is significantly worse. Um, if we look at um, El Chapo in Mexico, his cartel remains the biggest distributor of drugs in North America, um, despite the fact that he has been arrested. Uh, John Gotti in New York, the American mafia continues to operate to this day. Um, C.C. Lop arrested um, in our region, they continue to operate. So on one side, but also don't get me wrong, there's deep psychological value for the Australian public to see the mm. Mr. Biggs, and they are Mr. Biggs, not Mrs. Biggs, mm. the Mr. Biggs arrested. Um, 
but it doesn't have a lasting impact on the market. Secondly, what we've done is we've taken a range of really great data sets that are available through the domestic and international law enforcement community. So we know from the wastewater analysis that's done by the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, we know roughly with a fair degree of accuracy how much uh, methamphetamine and how much heroin and how much cocaine is consumed in this country. We know roughly from police intelligence and information how much that's worth at the street level. We know how much a kilo is worth at the wholesale level here in Australia, and we've got great data across the region. So the work that I've done is pieced all of that together mm. um, to provide an indicative example of it. Um, but let me assure you, disrupting that supply is really a difficult and, in fact, a very difficult strategic endeavour. Uh, it's not just a, about locking up a collection of bad guys. It's also about creating the environment where those that would come behind them can't continue to operate. Doesn't that suggest, though, I mean, I'm just, just from, this is all off, off script here, so I apologise, but doesn't no, that like suggest, that. though, that they're most likely more organised than the authorities chasing them? And, and two parts of this, I mean, sure, we take out Mr Big, but what about trying to take out anybody and everybody who is part of this operation from the lowest to the highest? Why not take out the whole lot instead of just Mr Big? Look, I mean, part of the problem is this, and I, I, I like to give it as an example. At the beginning of every financial year, police commissioners across the world are given a budget. In Australia, whether they're the Australian Federal Police Commissioner, Queensland Police Commissioner, New South Wales Police Commissioner, they're all given a budget. So uh, for, the, for interest's sake and for, for today, for simplicity, let's say they get $100. Now, with that $100, um, Mike, what they've got to do is they've got to make decisions based on guidance. So they'll put $10 to saving kids from child exploitation, $20 to save, and these are sort of just random figures, just an example, but $20 to do counterterrorism, 30 to do organised crime and so on. Um, but by default, so for instance, and to put it in a really clear sense, if you give $20 or 20% of your budget to saving children's lives um, from child exploitation, that means that only a certain number of children will be, some, will be rescued, only a certain number of double or of investigations will be completed, but by default that means other investigations can't be done. Um, secondly, the amount of reported crime in Australia's jurisdictions far exceeds its capacity to investigate. So there's just not enough, um, and it's not about, um, you know, you can keep spending money, more and more money. This is about, um, simply put, you couldn't spend enough to investigate all of the crime mm. in that way. So uh, this is about having the most, the biggest impact and disproportionate impacts on the crime environment. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're talking drugs also, let's, let's not forget, you know, there's two parts of the drug equation. So my report specifically looks at drug supply, but our problem in this country is one of demand. Um, for whatever reason, Australians uh, are willing to pay more for their drugs. Uh, they seem to be price insensitive. And as a nation... Um, we consume more and more regularly illicit drugs than most other countries in the world. That's the more troubling part of it. So, you know, to put it simply, it's, it's become a modern policing adage, but uh, you can't arrest your way out of this problem. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I have to uh, admit being stupid here, but I can't really see why not. Uh, because you, you, if you go at them and at it and at it, surely you're going to dent that car. It's just like keep thumping and thumping and thumping. So, and I, and I can see your point, but uh, from a, uh, a layman's perspective and someone sitting here just talking about this and having been, been affected by it with uh, friends, um, I just can't see why they, you know, it's, it's all very easy to say, well, we can't do a whole lot, we're doing the best we can. Well, they need to do better. That's what I think. I, I think, Mike, I think you're right. They do need to do better, but you know, I think the issue here is is that the models we've used in the past, this arrest the problem, mm. um, doesn't necessarily solve, provide an absolute solution. And like the other part about it is, is you know, and I often say this, you know, if you ask most police officers in this country, as an example, if you arrest, um, you know, a 16-year-old child and um, charge them for possession of a $20 marijuana foil um, and inject them in the justice system, as an example. Um, realistically, that is only going to go longer term in one direction, which mm. is increased criminality. So there's that part of that component. So arresting everybody for, say, possession it doesn't help. Um, you are right. We can go harder. Um, my point is, though, is that, you know, where people are making, um, you know, 80 and 90% profit, 
it's very hard and where there are very low barriers to uh, market entry in an economic sense. So, mm. for instance, um, you know, you take out person A and there's three other people behind them ready mm. to start producing drugs using very different methods or different importation methods. Mm. Uh, so, you know, there's a real entrepreneurial style there. So what you need to do, and this is at the core of this report that uh, myself and Dr. Tegan Westendorf did, which is... Um, we look across the whole supply chain. So let's look at the thing that affects us the most in this country in terms mm. of illicit drugs, ice. Mm. Mm. Um, the people making the least amount of profit along that profit uh, line are people who are transporting it and manufacturing it in the dark corners of Myanmar. Um, the weakness in that market is, um, to be quite frank, the supply of precursors. So the drugs that are used to manufacture um, methamphetamine, and those are the things that need to be targeted. Um, secondly, and I think this is uh, just as important, um, proceeds of crime and unexplained wealth provisions in Australia's law uh, community need to be used more frequently. So this is the case where you see, um, you know, and it's a caricature, but this is the case where you see a person with a taxable income of, you know, a couple of thousands or $10,000 a year who's driving around, um, you know, sports cars, spending huge amounts of money on real estate. Um, the fact of the matter is, is we need to actively pursue those who use and spend unexplained wealth. And if they can't explain where that wealth comes from, mm. then it ought to be seized by the public. Can you tell us the quantum and the proportion of profits retained in Australia? Look, it's it, to be quite frank, it varies quite significantly, but you can expect... so. You know, it, it, we've taken a very simplified model to it, and I'm, I'm not using weasel words here or anything like that, but when I say that, what it doesn't, our model doesn't take into account is the person who receives a kilo of pure methamphetamine and then mixes it with glucose to double or triple their profits. But certainly, you know, you can lose, they can lose up to 80% of imports coming in this country and still make a profit from um, the sale. So what other business can you lose 80% of your... Um, of your importation and the market continues and that's the sort of scale we're talking about you gave the figures earlier to um in our interview mm. you know 5.8 um, billion dollars in methamphetamine sales in this country it's amazing isn't it it's just uh, scary and amazing your report examines china and myanmar as an important region in the supply chain is this a recent development uh, look, it's, it's a fast evolving one, over, but it has started and finds its roots about 10 years ago. And I think for those watching this, it's really important to put this context in your mind that this is a transnational activity where um, incredibly entrepreneurial people are taking advantage of a range of activities. So here's the story. Um, so in terms of the key facilitator of this is one C. G. Lop, who's alleged to be the uh, number three in an organisation called The Company mid 90s that C.G. Lop is arrested in the US. He's a low level member of um, of a um, triad in China, but working in the US. He does some time in the jail, then disappears out into the ether. Then over the last sort of 15 years, he's become a key player in an organization that goes a little like this. Um, First off, what we see is in China over the last two decades, massive economic growth. So there's tens of thousands of um, facilities across uh, China, mainland China, producing chemicals and pharmaceuticals. So all of a sudden, and pretty much unregulated in many cases, all of a sudden you have access to a large amount of precursors. Um, C. C. Lot behind the scenes brings together all of the triads who traditionally fight and compete with each other. They look for a place where they can act with impunity without having interference from um, law, without interference from law enforcement, etc. So they find the perfect place. Um, the Shan and Wa states in Myanmar, a far-flung part of the um, Mekong sub-region. They use those sites. They pay a, essentially rental to the local uh, militias to be able to operate there. Now. If we go back a little bit in time again, in the 1970s, Taiwan invested significantly in um, STEM subjects, so science, technology. Uh, a lot of those people went off to China. As China's education system lifted and their economic miracle happened, um, those people, those Taiwanese scientists, chemists, etc., have left with our jobs. So what we find is a large number of Taiwanese nationals working in the um, 
Mekong subregion involved in the production of methamphetamines. Uh, the Chinese economic miracle and the growth of their Belt and Road Initiative meant that all this investment in new border crossings saw an increase in trade across the region. And all of a sudden, within a matter of days, trips that would once take seven days, you know, you can move drugs from um, the backwaters of Myanmar to a port in Thailand within a day or two. Um, all of these things were going along. So we saw this perfect storm of activity occur. At the same time, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations was trying to reduce um, the impediments to greater economic cooperation. So there was less and less border controls. Um, and this problem just grew proportionally from there. You know, I want to sort of say to you, you know, I once visited in the last two years a, um, a what they call a clandestine laboratory. Now, in Australia, we call a clandestine laboratory someone building something in the back of their house and making and producing methamphetamine. Um, this clandestine factory was spread over 20 kilometres, uh, 20 acres of land um, and was had two supply chains. It was producing pure methamphetamine for those um, low volume, high mar profit markets like Australia and New Zealand. And on the other side, it was producing low quality uh, Yaba tablets for the Asian market, which is a mix of caffeine and methamphetamines. Um, what we saw coming out of here was a truly transnational organized crime. And on the return route, what we see is casinos. So there's hundreds of casinos popped up all across the region. Um, many of which are involved in the either directly or turning a blind eye to um, the laundering of money relating to transnational serious organised crime. So where it's a truly transnational activity enabled by a range of factors, including one of which is, is the lack of control of precursors in China um, and the difficult... Um, almost wild west type structures of some of these share, these states within Myanmar so that you can act with impunity from law enforcement. So what about the Mexican cartels? Do they feature in the supply chains for illicit drugs or is their involvement more on the, uh, the, the top of the world for the uh, US North America area? Look, I think that they're expanding and I think this is where... Um, so we took a generalised approach to, to provide an example for, in terms of the region. Um, having done a study a couple of years ago on Mexican cartels and the likelihood that they might come to Australia, um, there's a couple of enabling factors. So in terms of, let's talk first about uh, their activities. So in terms of North, the North American market, they've saturated the market with cocaine. Um, you know, and at one stage, I sort of started about a decade ago, what we saw is uh, Mexican cartels exchanging cocaine for British Columbian marijuana because they just couldn't expand any more into um, the US market. Uh, we saw them exchanging on a, almost like a nation in terms of trade basis with the Chinese triads in Hong Kong and mainland China exchanging cocaine directly for methamphetamines and methamphetamine precursors. Um, so they are most definitely, a, a, you know, they're always looking for growth. At the end of the day, though, proportionally, um, Australia, and they're a main supplier of cocaine into Australia um, and some methamphetamine. Uh, Australia represents for them a place to expand, but in a different way than they did in the US. It's a low volume comparatively market with a high, high profit. Um, but what we saw in sort of North America and specifically in the US is the Mexican cartels attempt to take over the whole supply chain. So they use their diasporas um, their communities in the US and they, they sort of try to take out everything from street distribution all the way back to manufacturing. Mm. They can't use that same model in Australia and they can't use the same model of violence that they apply uh, in, um, in Mexico and the US. So, you know, any Mexican cartel problem we have here in this country won't be exactly the same as what's represented in, um, in the US or in Mexico. Uh, but for those watching this here, sure enough, if you're in Sydney and Melbourne consuming cocaine, that cocaine has at least some involvement with Mexican cartels before it arrived in this country. How much support do we receive from Chinese and Burmese authorities in regards to these investigations? Um, look, you know, let, we'll start off with the Chinese. We've had some great success in terms of um, police to police cooperation. So at, at a very operational level, um, there was a task force that's been running for about two years at the moment called uh, Operation Blaze, but where 
Chinese authorities, so Chinese police and Australian federal police are working together to pursue those who are exporting um, illicit drugs and specifically methamphetamine into Australia. So there is some cooperation there. Um, that bigger piece in terms of better regulating their chemical and pharmaceutical industry, uh, I think that's a big problem. Um, certainly, and we saw this with the Americans um, under the Bush administration, sorry, under the Trump administration pressuring Chinese um, President Xi Jinping, um, saying, you know, you must do something about your synthetic opioid production and your involvement, uh, as in your country's involvement um, in, in that production. So um, I think that there's a lot of work to be done around um, working with the Chinese authorities to better regulate their chemical and pharmaceutical industries. Um, We've had some really great cooperation over recent years um, with the Myanmarese authorities, um, of course, now, um, and a lot of that around capacity development. And certainly when you go and visit, uh, for instance, the Thai-Myanmar uh, border, there's a, there's a lot of cooperation at the border between authorities. Um, unfortunately, the challenge is the Myanmarese authorities themselves have very little uh, control over what happens in the Shan and Wa state. Uh, secondly, is that as we've seen after the military coup, I think there's, you know, uh, cooperation is going to grind to a big halt between our law enforcement agencies and theirs, uh, and the likely little possibility of of greater um, greater involvement of certain elements of the military in the distribution of drugs in all of that uncertainty, I think, is a real possibility. So. Um, you know, I think the cooperation is going the opposite direction of where we want it to go uh, for the time being. There are very, um, very creative the uh, people in this industry. I mean, I was just thinking about the uh, Belt and Road Initiative from the Chinese government in, say, particular countries and, and areas, say, for example, in Victoria. Uh, is there a correlation between the Belt and Road Initiative and the initiative of the drug trade for that particular area? Look, not so much for Victoria. I think where it is about is connectivity. So uh, I, I want to give you two examples. Um, so the first one is, is that, you know, if, if you've got more, more bridges and roads crossing over from Laos or Myanmar into Thailand, um, you're increasing the volume at the same time of economic activity. So packages come in, people coming across that border. Um, and you're increasing the velocity of those. So all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden trips are more possible by better investment in infrastructure. So those are all very positive things. But if you're not prepared for those, so if you don't have the border arrangements in place to do better targeting, then um, there are a lot more opportunities for you to smuggle drugs across those international borders. Mm. Uh, just recently, and I've had this, I was heavily criticised by, um, in, um, Chinese uh, newspapers in mainland but, uh, China for this, but you know the recent discussions around um, Daru in the um, Papua New Guinea and building a, a fishing industry there and a large investments by the Chinese um, government. Um, what a wonderful opportunity for um, for the Papua New Guineans. There can be no doubt about that. But that sort of growth where you go from having a couple of fishing boats transiting through the regions uh, to hundreds, or if not thousands. Um, that close to Australia will create specific risks because all of a sudden, an, an, old, an old drug detective in New South Wales once told me this, and it was a good way to put it. He said, you know, John, um, you've got to have two things in international drug trade because you've got to have um, a, a flow of traffic to hide your stuff in and you've got to have a flow of money going back the other way to pay your bills. Mm. And in doing that, so for instance, if you've only got 100 packages coming from your country to my country, you have a one in 100 um, chance of hiding your your uh, drugs or illicit commodities. If it's one in a thousand, that's totally different. If it's one in 10,000, uh, it becomes easier and easier in that volume to hide what you're doing. What are your main policy recommendations from your paper? Uh, look, straight up, I'm gonna say this, which is uh, number one is we need to do more around precursors and the control of chemicals and pharmaceuticals across our region. Um, number two, um, we need to work at a multilateral level and build up better border controls with Laos and Myanmar uh, to intercept drugs into this country. Number three, we must actively pursue using um, proceeds of crime legislation to deny criminals in Australia access to their ill-gotten gains. Um, and we should double, triple, quadruple down on those, those things. Um, this is the controversial one, my, me personally, and I, a lot of my police colleagues uh, don't agree with me on this, but uh, I don't think we should legalise drugs, illicit 
drugs or drugs that are currently illicit in this community. Um, but I think that we should decriminalise them in a way that people don't end up injected it for what is, in essence, a medical problem, um, and no pun intended, injected into the justice system, uh, which gives a suboptimal outcome. So all we do by putting people who are addicted to drugs into the justice system, um, and you know, I, I'm sure this, all we do is um, create the next generation of bigger criminals. Uh, they're the cannon fodder of the war on drugs. Great conversation, John. John Coyne, thank you very much. Thanks, Mike.